Good afternoon. And welcome, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I'm Deanna Santiago from Mass Advocates for Children. Um, and thank you for joining us for Basic Rights, supporting parents who are immigrants and or limited English proficient in the special education process, a webinar for direct service providers. Um, and I'll be uh, presenting this webinar today in collaboration with Laura Perez, um, parent advocate at MAC, um, who will also be introducing herself shortly. Um, so I am a, an attorney at Mass Advocates for Children, or MAC, um, focusing on special education. MAC is a nonprofit advocacy organization with a mission of removing barriers to educational and life opportunities for children and youth. We do this through education and training, legal assistance to individual families, and systemic advocacy. So at MAC, we have a project called Proyecto Acceso a la Educación Especial, which provides information and advocacy in the area of special education to Latino families. Through Proyecto Acceso, we have a helpline um, for Spanish-speaking families to provide free of charge information, referrals, and advice in the areas of special education, student discipline, and bullying in schools. In limited cases, we are also able to provide direct legal advocacy um, to families in the area of special education through Proyecto Acceso. In addition to our helpline, we provide trainings in Spanish to Latino parents on basic rights in special education and the importance of their involvement in the process, as well as transition in special education. Um, so if you have an interest, if you regularly meet with a group of parents or have an interest in recruiting a group of, of Spanish-speaking parents um, who would be interested in a workshop, then definitely um, contact us after the webinar. Um, and I will let Laura introduce herself. Thank you, Diana, and it's a pleasure being here. And thank you, uh, Diana, for the opportunity to facilitate this workshop together. I am Laura Perez, and I work as a parent advocate in different capacities. Um, and I'm also the mother of a 20-year-old young man uh, with autism. So besides the professional experience, I uh, also bring the experience of raising and advocating for a child with special needs. Okay, and we're also here with Lilia, uh, Max Communications Manager, um, who will be receiving your questions about the webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to Lilia to go over some logistics. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, you should see a menu bar on your screen that includes a question box. You can submit your questions there at any time throughout the webinar, and I'll be reading them to Diana and Laura during our question breaks. We will do our best to get to all of your questions today, um, but depending on the volume of questions we receive, we may not be able to answer all of them here. Uh, if so, then we'll let you know how to follow up after the webinar. You can also let me know of any technical issues or anything like that in the question bar. Um, you'll also see in the menu bar that we've provided five handouts, including a short video that we'll be playing for you today. Please feel free to download and print these. You'll also receive an email after the webinar with the handouts and a video recording. Lastly, please fill out our short survey that we'll be sending you after the webinar is over. We really value your input and this feedback is important both for us and for our funders. Okay, thank you, Lilia. Um, and just before we start, I did wanna talk a little bit about why we are doing this webinar, um, focusing on immigrant and limited English proficient, which I'll refer to as LEP, uh, parents and students in the special education process. Um, and why we've done this, this is our, our third year um, doing a similar webinar. As you know, um, this is a population of students and families who face significant barriers um, and have been historically underserved. Since the election of 2016, in addition to many already existing barriers, immigrant families have been and will continue to face very real threats resulting from increasingly harsh immigration enforcement and open anti-immigrant sentiment. We're not immigration attorneys, um, nor do we pretend to be experts in immigration law and policy. 
We do know, however, that one effect of these forces is to further inhibit parent participation in the special education process. Parents are simply less likely to participate in team meetings or interact with school districts and other government agencies. We know that children whose parents participate access better services, so we see it as a priority to support them mm -hmm. in our role. And why do we uh, offer this webinar to professionals like you? Uh, well, for a few reasons. Um, the one is uh, we often get calls in our helpline from counselors, case managers, social workers, many of whom are bilingual, looking for advice related to their clients on special education matters. Also, uh, we've seen that many of you are strong advocates for your clients uh, because of the knowledge and training you have. And they're also a great resource of support as your family's advocate to uh, get the services that their children need. And then uh, MAC staff can only go to team meetings, as uh, Diana mentioned, only in very limited cases. So we want to do what we can to support you in the advocacy you do for parents and children. And of course, you, um, you, you work with the families and you see the barriers that the families are facing in these different school districts. So it's key that you uh, have this information. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready to start. Um, here is an overview. Um, yeah, so we are going to talk about uh, parents and the special education process with a focus on immigrants and uh, LEP parents. Uh, the next part, we'll talk about the steps that represent the special education process. And then throughout each of these steps, we will focus on the important role of parents for their children to access the services they need and tools that LEP parents can use to access services their children need. And we will stop for questions after the end of each of these sections, but please, as Lilia said, um, initially do send questions in as they come to mind um, and then Lilia will compile them and we will stop um, for questions at, at certain points during, you know, during the webinar. And these are the goals of the webinar, are to learn how laws can protect immigrant and LEP children in the special education process, to learn tools that parents um, that are immigrants or limited English proficient can use to be part of the special education process and get needed services for their children. So special education is a complex area of the law, and there's really no way that we can go over the process in a lot of detail in one webinar. So for that reason, I'll say now and remind you throughout the webinar often um, that Max Helpline is a resource that's available to you if you have questions about a specific family that you're working with. And at the end of the webinar, there is a, a list of resources that includes um, Max uh, helpline. The way that it works is that you call um, or a parent can call and leave a message and then within two to three days um, someone from our office will contact them um, to gather more information and to determine you know what what additional information we can provide. So these are legal protections um, that apply um, to immigrant families and children um, and children with disabilities. This webinar um, is really all of the information that we provide in the webinar is based on these laws and stems from these laws, um, which include the federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or Title VI, which provides protections um, to people based on national origin, the Equal Educational Opportunities Act of 1976, and state law, including Chapter 766, which is the, the Massachusetts State Education, Special Education Law, the Look Act, um, recently implemented in 2017, um, which is a new bilingual education law in Massachusetts that I'll be talking a little bit more about, as well as the Student Opportunity Act, which is really 
very recently implemented um, at the end of last year. Um, something that's important to keep in mind, if nothing else from this entire webinar, is that the right to a free and appropriate public education applies to all eligible students with disabilities, regardless of their immigration status. So public education, including special education services for students who require those services, applies to all students with disabilities in the United States, all students in the United States, regardless of their immigration status. As a part of Project Access, so uh, Mac has developed a series of videos, both in English and Spanish, uh, on special education. And you can see the different topics here, from requesting a school evaluation to immigrant special education, interpreters, uh, getting documents in your language, responding to the IEP, and uh, getting an independent evaluation or a second opinion. All these are very uh, important uh, topics for our families. Um, and uh, uh, the end, well, you have here the both links for uh, these uh, videos, and we encourage you to share these links with your families so they can as access uh, this important information. Um, in a, in a, I think the next we'll show a short clip of one of them. Yeah, and I just, you know, again, that the rights that are highlighted in these six short videos stem. Um, from laws that we will be discussing throughout the webinar. Um, so we would definitely encourage you to uh, use and share them widely. I'm just gonna, we're just going to show part of this um, video. And again, the links are included here. Whoops. <laughs> Hi, Ariana. How are you? Hi, my love. Abel, could you please go to Natalia's room? Maybe she can show you her new keyboard. I am not doing so well. On my way over, I saw my co-worker and he told me his cousin might be deported. I am so scared. Next week, I have Abel's team meeting. Could the school find out that I don't have documents? I know you are scared and I understand why you feel that way. Many people are scared but the school isn't allowed to ask you about your immigration status, your social security number, or other information that might tell them you don't have documents. If someone from the school asks, you should not tell them. What should I say if someone from school asks for information that I don't want to tell them? I have a friend who told her son's principal, I prefer not to share that information, thank you, when he asks her where her son was born. You can always respond like that. All children have the right to enroll in public school. Okay, so we're going to stop the video. You're more than welcome in your handouts is, is the complete video or to go to one of these links um, to see the rest of the video. But we just wanted to give you um, a little flavor for what they are. Okay, so we continue on and um, we know that uh, uh, given the current political climate in the U.S., uh, immigrants, parents, and students have justifiable concerns um, to feel um, fear and being afraid of speaking out, especially in the schools. But it's important to remember that immigrant students and parents, including those that are undocumented, have more rights in education than in other realms. Uh, for instance, um, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, all children have the right to attend public school regardless of immigration status. And uh, it is illegal for schools to discriminate against a student or a parent on the basis of national origin. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will find uh, places and recommendations that parents uh, may connect if their rights or their child's rights are being violated. And one of your, your handouts um, that's attached um, that you should be able to download um, is a flyer in English and in Spanish that highlights these rights and additional rights that immigrant parents and students have in, in the area of education. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, some in, very briefly important um, laws, state and federal laws, that impact immigrant students and, par and parents um, and students with disabilities. 
so in um, so starting with the Look Act, um, and on this page are all newer state laws um, and one bill. So one of them is the Massachusetts Learning Opportunities for Our Kids, or Look Act, and uh, which was went into law in Massachusetts in um, in 2018. And what the Look Act does is shifts from an English only mindset um, in terms of instruction for English learners and all students really um, that has been in place um, since Massachusetts in 2002 by voter re referendum became um, a quote unquote English only um, state in terms of instruction for students. Um, so in 2002, the law, that law passed and options became very limited for school districts in terms of instruction of English learners um, and, and all students. Um, so this law, so instruction was primarily provided using a sheltered English immersion model um, with restricted use of native language instruction. Um, so students with disabilities were not affected uh, technically under that law, they were exempt, um, but they were definitely impacted by the shift uh, to the English only mentality. Um, so with the Look Act, there is uh, school districts can offer more instructional models, including dual language models, and that has already started to happen um, throughout Massachusetts. Um, and the Look Act, Look Act also requires that school districts form English learner parent committees um, to, as an, a very intentional way of gathering parent input in the process of designing new dual language um, models. And the Look Act also includes a provision that creates the seal of biliteracy, which is another way of, it's, it's almost like a, um, a credential that students can, can earn and take with them that really highlights um, the importance of um, bilingualism and the strength of bilingualism. Another new law um, that very recently passed, the Student Opportunity Act, um, is a very important law for, for students in Massachusetts and educators. And in, in very short, what the Student Opportunity Act does is increases the funding rate per student that's needed to provide an adequate education. Um, so the new formula also takes into account additional spending for English learners, low income students, and students with disabilities. And under the Student Opportunity Act, school districts are required to submit evidence-based plans every three years um, to show how they'll use the funds to close achievement or opportunity gaps that we know to exist. And finally, the Massachusetts School Interpreter Bill, um, the bill, so not yet a law, um, is um, being, re is a bill that MAC um, has been advocating for um, that would require standards for school interpreters similar to what exists for interpreters in medical settings and interpreters in court. Um, so as many of you as direct service providers, if you go to team meetings, um, you'll likely have seen a very wide range in terms of the training and qualifications that, that school interpreters have, have received. And they serve a very important role um, to support parent participation in the process. Um, so this is a bill that's moving along, has been reported out favorably, um, and which is, which is a good, um, step in the process and if you are interested in more information on how to get involved in advocacy for this bill please do send an email um, and we've provided an email here communications at massadvocates.org okay so those are all the state uh, new state bills uh, and state laws um, that have been recent um, as many of you i'm sure are aware um, there is also a lot of uh, federal changes to policy that have impacted immigrant students and families in, in very negative ways. Um, so starting with the new federal rule relating to public charge, um, what, the, what this new rule does um, is it expands the categories of public benefits 
um, that can use, be used in the public charge test. Um, so for immigrants who are applying to remain permanently in the United States, I should say some immigrants um, who are applying to remain permanently in the United States, um, the Department of Homeland Security uses a, a weighing test um, to as a means for assessing whether a person is likely to become a public charge. Um, so this is public charge has existed for many, many years, uh, but this new rule expands it to include categories of benefits, um, including um, food stamp or SNAP benefits, Medicaid benefits, um, and housing benefits. Um, it's important to note that um, children ages 21 and under who access Medicaid benefits, um, as well as pregnant women, are exempt um, from this. From this, um, or I should say that 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 factor is it would not be weighed against them um, in a determination of public charge. Um, the law also, this new rule also requires immigration officials to heavily weigh age which negatively impacts children and the elderly and certain health conditions um, in making determinations about whether an individual is likely to become a public charge. Um, so this, this is a really um, terrible new law um, that puts immigrant families in the position of choosing whether to access these benefits to meet their children's basic needs and potentially harm their chances of being able to gain permanent status or for forego the benefit. So if you have um, are working with parents who are concerned about the implications of accessing public benefits, there are many, many immigrants to whom this new rule does not apply. Um, and I would just urge you at the end of this uh, webinar, um, there are some resources. I know Health Law Advocates um, you know, it provides information in this area and many immigrant rights agencies that, that have um, that have released information um, that's accessible to parents to assess the actual risk amidst all of the confusion and fear that this this law and other immigration policy have, have brought about. Another um, unhappy development um, is a new policy that was reported by the New York Times very recently, that is the deployment of Vortac agents to sanctuary cities, um, which, you know, Boston is on the list of, of sanctuary cities um, where this um, purportedly is going to be happening. Um, and just to quote the New York Times, um, Vortac, which acts essentially as the SWAT team of the Border Patrol, um, with additional gear such as sun grenades and enhanced special forces type training, including sniper certification, um, with officers who typically conduct high-risk operations targeting individuals who are known to be violent, um, many of them with extensive criminal records. Um, so these are agents who are typically used on the border um, to target drug smugglers and cartels, and, and they're being deployed to sanctuary cities um, with the purpose of instilling more fee, fear among immigrants in, in these cities. Um, the 2020 census, as many of you are likely aware, the, the Trump administration attempted to add a question um, regarding citizen status to the um, 2020 census that they were not successful. The Supreme Court did not allow them to add this question. Um, despite that, um, the chilling effect remains, um, especially in combination with all of the other anti-immigrant policies. So, um, afraid, you know, with with reason and and confused. There's so much confusion around who is impacted by what laws, um, what choices, um, you know, immigrant families should make for their families, um, and um, so, you know, we really want to, you know, validate that fear and confusion. Um, at the same time, we see our role as highlighting, um, you know, the rights and providing, you know, correct information um, regarding the rights of immigrant families um, and children so that they can make um, the decisions that are, are best for their families based on, on 
true information. Um, and so one thing that we, again, are, you know, we're always highlighting and I'll highlight again here now, um, is that eligible students with disabilities um, have a right to special education regardless of immigration status, even with the above changes. Um, and we know that there's confusion in this area. Just, just earlier this week, um, we had a call to our helpline um, from, a, from a parent whose son was placed in a private school out of district, so funded by the local school district, um, who, who had, um, who was going to be applying for permanent status um, in the United States and was concerned that his son who has a disability and is in this um, placement funded by the school district as a special education student, um, that that was going to um, result in him being considered to be a public charge. And that's, that's a clear cut case where absolutely not, at least, at least due to his, you know, attending, accepting these special education services and attending um, this school funded by the public school district. Um, you know, we don't know what other public benefits they may be accessing um, or anything like that, but at least, you know, for that specific concern, we can definitively say that at this time, um, you know, that will not impact um, in terms of the, the weighing test um, for public charge. And um, so we uh, come to a section that is it's um, it uh, it's key, which is uh, parents are very not important, are very important in the process of special education. Um, no one is more invested in a child's well-being than their parent or guardian. Um, parents also bring important information to the special education team. Uh, they're the ones to see firsthand their child's not only struggles, but also strengths. And they can also report on their child's learning and development at home and in the community, which is different to what the school can be seeing in school. This means parents are the real experts on their child, and as such, their voice is key in the special education process. And uh, it's not just saying that, it's that uh, the law requires that school uh, gives parents advance notice of all team meetings and give consent before doing any evaluations and implementing the IEP. Unfortunately, as many of you may see firsthand, the reality is that it doesn't always play out in practice. For instance, parents get to the meeting and there's no interpreter uh, or the interpreter is not a qualified interpreter. Uh, so the reality is that uh, children whose parents are involved in the process and fight uh, and are knowledgeable about the process and fight for what they need will be prioritized by school districts in the special education process. Okay, and just to, to reiterate this really important point here, um, when a parent's language, primary language is not English. Um, the law requires that the school district provide trained and qualified interpreters at all team meetings. So it's not enough for the individual serving as an interpreter to be bilingual. That person also must be trained in the ethics of interpretation, confidentiality, confidentiality and the specialized terminology that's used in special education. Um, in addition, the school district has the obligation legally to translate all IEPs, evaluations, and school notices into parents' primary language if that's what they prefer. Um, if that is not happening, and I'm sure that many of you in working with clients have seen um, that unfortunately this very often does not happen, um, what I often recommend is that um, as an initial step, if the parent has seen that this has been a problem, perhaps the school district has been providing a specific interpreter who, um, who is not qualified and has not really allowed them to meaningfully participate in a team meeting, that although they shouldn't have to do this, this isn't you know an obligation of the parents here, um, but it's often a good idea to just in advance of the team meeting in writing through an email or 
on paper, just ensure that the interpreter that will be at the team meeting um, will be trained and qualified. Um, we know that delaying team meetings can have implications for students. Um, so while that is you know, an option for parents at the meeting to say, look, I don't wanna move forward with this meeting because I can't meaningfully participate. We know that sometimes that decision can be complicated by urgent circumstances that their children are dealing with. So, um, so I, I would always suggest that if it's been an issue in the past to raise it with the school district. Um, and if that continues to not be effective, um, or if the parent just knows that there's there's not really um, an, an intention by the school district to resolve the issue um, without another push, the parent does have the, op the option of filing a complaint with the State Department of Education Problem Resolution System. Um, and here there's a link um, to that and there are forms available in many different languages um, if the parent completes it in English, they can actually submit it electronically. They haven't yet um, allowed that option for, for students who speak other languages, but the forms are translated. And if you or if a parent that you're working with is interested in some guidance on how to complete that intake and what information to provide in addition, then definitely do contact Max Helpline for guidance and templates. Also just wanted to mention that in your handouts is a um, guidance that was issued it's kind of a fact sheet that's that was issued um, by the department of justice and the u.s uh, department of education that um that outlines some language rights for for parents who are limited english proficient we're going to stop here for questions so we're getting lots of questions thank you um <laughs> I just want to say also, this is Lilia, um, we are getting a report of all of your questions and we have your email addresses, so if we're not able to get to your question today, we can follow up with you after the webinar. Um, so our first question is uh, in regards to a school that has a new rule stating that all people, including parents who enter the school, now need to show a photo ID. Um, and if parents don't have a photo ID, then they have to give their name and birth date, and that information is entered into third-party software that's used to check uh, to see if you're a sex offender, but the information gets to be stored by a third-party vendor. <laughs> so how would you reconcile this policy with advice to tell parents that they don't have to answer direct questions about their identity? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question, um, and I am really sorry that that is happening. Um, I, you know, what I would do, likely do if we, if we got that question, you know, on our helpline is I, there are a few people that I would want to consult with, I think, before, um, before answering that question. So I can do that and I can, I can get back to you. I might um, just want to consult perhaps with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights um that has been doing some work in the area and possibly even the, the aclu of massachusetts um but i don't want to i don't want to provide incorrect information um and it's it's so specific um and complex so i i think that i i'll get back to you after the webinar thank you okay um our next question does the look act have an age limit or is that available to students of all ages so the Look Act is available to all students who are in in public school. Um, so it's you know it, there is no age limit, um, but it is it's an act that allows school districts, so public school districts, um, generally for students up until you know about the age of 18, but sometimes up to 22 as we know for for students with disabilities or maybe some students with interrupted education so um but it's it's all public school and it's really it's not a mandate for school districts um you know to create these new models of instruction um but it allows them the flexibility to create these models so it's a reason why the English Learner Parent Advisory Councils, or these, you know, that are also school districts are required to have that parent input, um, is is so important because if there is a kind of convening of a group of parents who are interested in seeing 
um, more options for dual language instruction in school districts, then the school district is more likely to respond um, and to create those models. Um, we had a few questions about public charge and BORTAC, what the BORTAC officers are, if you know what that stands for, um, and what you mean by public charge, and whether they can come to school, the officers. Okay, so I'll start with the with the public charge. Um, so public charge, this as I as I said, um, you know, during the webinar, this is um, a policy that has existed for many many years, um, where where um, immigrant um, individuals who are immigrants who are applying to remain permanently in the United States or may apply to remain permanently in the United States at some point, so legal immigrants, um, are if they access certain public benefits, um, in the past those public benefits have been primarily cash benefits um, like TAFDC, or Social Security Disability Benefits, SSI, I'm sorry, so not SSDI, but SSI um, could be subject to public charge. So their access of those benefits could be neg could negatively weigh against their, um, their uh, opportunity to remain permanently in the United States legally. Um, so what this new rule relating to public charge does is expands the category of benefits beyond um, those cat, you know, cash benefits um, to include Medicaid benefits, so health benefits, um, public health benefits, um, and um, food stamp SNAP benefits. Um, and, and housing benefits, which just affects more families um, and, you know, who may be legal immigrants who are applying to remain permanently in the United States. So that's, that's what the public charge does, rule does. It's intended as a deterrent for legal immigrants um, to access these needed benefits and is just sends a message that um, even legal immigrants really, you know, Aren't, aren't welcome in our country um, and allows them, you know, less opportunity to meet the basic needs of their families. Um, in terms of the BORTAC, um, it's, it's not something that I know a lot about, um, but, you know, it's, it's a policy that, um, you know, in terms of, you know, as we shouldn't know a lot of, I mean, it's really a, you know, been, um, a part of immigration enforcement that that has has been at the border really has really focused on um, you know da really dangerous um, criminals and these are highly specialized um, you know officials um, who who carry out this role. If, if people remember the case of Elian Gonzalez um, many years ago, I don't even remember the the year, but the boy. Um, who who was coming to the United States from Cuba, um, and the raft sank, and he, you know, there was a a, a little like little a major dispute between Cuba and the United States regarding, you know, where this child should be, and there there are these infamous images of of officers, um, you know. Finding him in his closet with guns drawn and bulletproof vests, and you know those are BORTAC um, officers, which were very inappropriately and in, infamously used in that case. Um, but these these officers also in our cities are are really, um, you know, unnecessary. You know, they're in terms of the immigrants who live in our cities, as we know, are not um, dangerous people. Um, and you know, so it's just wholly unnecessary and really just a fear tactic that's that's being used. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, we'll have more break coming up, so if you have more questions, please keep those coming. Our last question is: Is it the school's responsibility to interpret communication from parents if it's not in English? So, for example, if parents write a letter to the school to request an IEP meeting and their letter is written in Spanish? Yes. Yes, so students, it, it is the school district's obligation um, to 
communicate with the parent um, in their primary language. Parents have no obligation to, to have that information translated um, into English before sending it to the school district. Um, we and have any communication, not necessarily just IEP related, but any communication that they need to have either with a teacher, the special ed teacher, the, whoever it is in the school, the parents should feel free to write the letter in whichever their language is, and then the school has the obligation to have it translated. Absolutely. And we have, as we'll talk about and when we're for the rest of the, the this webinar, when we're focused on special education, um, we will specifically, uh, MAC has a lot of template letters in English and in Spanish that parents can use while they're navigating the special education process. Um, and, uh, you know, those template letters, at least we, we have them, the Spanish translations, I always, we always include a, the English version below just to try to reduce the, the chances of delay just from a practical standpoint, um, not because school districts, because the parent is legally obligated or, you know, to provide that information in English to get a response, um, but just for, for practical purposes. So, um, so yeah, so absolutely not that they're not required to translate them. Okay, so now we're going to um, focus on the special education process um, and really focusing on um, rights that um, limited English proficient um, students and parents um, have in the in this process. And this this slide is the overall special education process and timeline um, split up into three steps, including a referral. For an evaluation, second step, which is the team meeting, and the third step, which is the school district issuing an IEP and the parent's response to the IEP. So for students who already have an IEP, steps two and three happen at least one time each year. Um, the evaluations happen at least every three years, in some cases more often. Um, and you'll see in this slide, um, I'm not gonna go through the timelines in, in a lot of detail, um, but that there are timelines written into this process, um, which really forces the school district to comply with parent requests for, for evaluations and to really just you know proceed with the process in terms of the issuance of the IEP and the implementation of the IEP. Um, so, so throughout the rest of the workshop, we're going to talk about each of these three steps. And I should say IEP stands for Individualized Education Program. I apologize in advance, um, you know, for those of you who are, who are less familiar with the process. And, and we will talk more about what, um, what the Individualized Education Program, or IEP, um, is a little bit later in the workshop. Okay, so uh, the next, uh, this uh, first step is uh, evaluations. So um, what happens is uh, if the uh, student is new to uh, potentially being part of the special education process, then we do a referral. Anybody can do a referral. Uh, a parent with a specific concern can do a referral. A pediatrician, uh, even a teacher can do a referral. So anybody who is involved in this uh, 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 child's life can uh, make a referral uh, for the school to do an evaluation. So then uh, the school needs to ask parents for written consent to evaluate the child within five school days, which means the school cannot evaluate the child if without uh, the parent's consent. Um, so we do, uh, we make the referral and then the school sends the written consent, the uh, parents, the mom or dad signs the consent, and then the school has 30 days to uh, complete the evaluation. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, important to see here that uh, the school, when they send the written consent uh, for the evaluation, the school needs to indicate what type of evaluation uh, they will be doing. Is it an academic evaluation? Is it a psychological evaluation? Um, and again, to uh, reinforce the fact with the uh, parents that the school cannot evaluate a student without their consent. 
Um, the evaluations, as Diana mentioned, are um, supposed to be at least every three years, but uh, is, uh, um, we need to point out here that if at any time there is uh, any changes, uh, the parents are seeing a change in the behavior, a change in the school performance, anything that is a concern, uh, the parents can um, uh, talk to address the school again and see if there are any other evaluations that need to be done that hadn't been done in the past. And then we have uh, um, mentioned before different types of uh, evaluations. So we have the, the required assessments like educational or any uh, assessment related to the child's disability, it can be a speech and language uh, assessment, an OT assessment. Um, and we often suggest to parents with uh, children with a disability that affects speech to also request an assistive technology evaluation as many school districts will not initiate this otherwise. So we have, as we can see here, psychological evaluations, home uh, uh, assessments, and for those students over the age of 14, the school needs to do a transition and functional vocational assessment. Um, uh, then we have the uh, another tip type of evaluation could be the functional behavioral assessment. If uh, are we observing any um, behavior issues, is there anxiety? What is triggering these uh, behaviors? So um, that's when the functional behavioral assessment comes in. And then another one is uh, observation. We can. Uh, parents or independent evaluators or any uh, professional that is um, tending to the child on a regular basis, they can make an appointment and then go observe the child and to make sure that, uh, see if the child is making progress and if the program has the ability to enable the child to make effective progress. So we can observe, um, as in, uh, for instance, if we see different behavior at home versus on school or in the community, then that's a good uh, reason uh, to do an observation, what to understand why the child is behaving differently in different environments. And we can also ask to observe in different uh, environments, like it's very different to observe a child during recess or during the cafeteria, that, uh, that a child who's uh, in a math class or a science class. So it, uh, it's important to do this, those observations also in different environments. And um, we often ask parents to contact our helpline if their child has a therapist or social worker and whether that person would be willing to go to the school to observe, uh, that they give a professional point of view that is very important to advocate for any changes or services in the school. And uh, as someone familiar with a child outside the school environment, your insight and documentation of that insight can be very useful for parents seeking changes or even clarification about the special education services their child is receiving. Okay, and just, you know, all testing that is done for the, for the students and this applies to English learner students, um, it must um, be in the form, you know, including in the language, most likely to accurately assess what the child knows and can do um, academically, developmentally, and functionally. So school districts um, for English learner students, if they require testing to be done in their native language, then the school district must conduct testing in that student's native language. And the um, schools need to send um copy of the evaluations two days before the meeting, the IEP meeting, uh, in their language. Absolutely. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in, in the context of the team meeting also about that. Um, so again, in terms of, you know, evaluations and English learners, um, you know, testing must be done in the student's native language. Um, if, if that is the language, most likely, you know, the foremost, um, that will most accurately assess what the child knows and can do. Testing must be done in a non-discriminatory manner. Um, so this is, um, I was at a, a talk um, yesterday um, where a presenter was focusing on this issue and gave the example of, um, of you know, a testing question that involves chimneys. Um, and for a student who 
um, did not have chimneys in his native country. And therefore, you know, depending on the context of the question might put that student at a disadvantage in being able to respond to that question. Um, so there are a lot of examples about this um, in, ter in terms of, um, you know, the um, discrimination and testing is a, is a huge issue. Um, all students identified as English learners must be tested yearly for English proficiency apart from um, the testing based on their disability. And um, the level that an English learner student is, is given um, for their, um, to identify um, their, at what level they are at is called the ELD level or English language development level. Um, and it includes levels one through six, um, with one being the most um, um, the most basic level up to six, which is, um, you know, most proficient, proficient, the most proficient. Um, and as Lauda mentioned, evaluation reports must be provided to parents um, in their primary language. Um, and there's nothing in the law that says that the school districts uh, have additional time um, to translate the documents. The same timeline still apply um, regardless of the native language um, of the parent or the student in terms of um, when to have the team meeting after the evaluations are completed. Okay, so at this point in the process, um, the school district, there's been a referral for an evaluation. The school district um, has done their evaluations and they've been discussed with the team um, and the parent doesn't agree with the school evaluations. Um, what option does the parent have here? And this really highlights a crucial uh, right that the parents have and a tool that the parents have in the law, um, which is the right to request an independent evaluation, including the right to request that the school district fund an independent evaluation. Um, and this, this comes into play where maybe the school district didn't make recommendations that were specific enough. Maybe the parent disagreed with the testing. Maybe the testing just, they, the parent felt like just didn't capture um, really the challenges um, and the strengths of that student. Um, so they wanna seek a second opinion. And there, there are different options um, for seeking school district funding for an evaluation. Um, the first option um, being the request that the district pay um, for the evaluation costs using a sliding fee scale. Um, so this includes paying for the entire cost of the evaluation up to 400% of the federal poverty level for, for a household. Um, so it isn't only very low income families. Um, and then after that point, it, it, the sliding fee kicks in. Um, for students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch, the school district must pay um, for the, the cost of the evaluation automatically uh, without the parent showing their income information. Um, the family annual income and sources must remain confidential. Uh, and this, this option applies if the family, parent or caregiver is requesting um, the independent evaluation within 16 months of the school evaluation. And under this option, the school district has to complete the evaluation, has to fund the evaluation, I should say, um, up to a certain amount. Um, you know, the school does not have the option of initiating a hearing um, before the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, which is, which is something that we'll, we'll talk about in, um, later in the webinar. The second option for requesting school district funding for an independent evaluation is the parent chooses not to provide their financial information, is they make the request and within five days, the school district must either agree to pay for the evaluation or initiate a hearing with, a BS, with the Bureau of Special Education Appeals to show that um, the, it is, shouldn't be necessary that the school district evaluations were, were adequate. Um, so, at MAC through our on our website and if, if for parents who contact our, our um, helpline, we have template letters in English and in Spanish that parents can use to request independent expert evaluation. This is probably the most frequent um, piece of information 
um, or resources that we provide to parents who contact our helpline um, with an issue that's going on at school. It's, it's get a second opinion, um, and this is what this provides. Um, I should also say um, that for parents who are requesting school district funding for independent evaluations, they won't, um, they, school districts are only required to pay up to a certain point and not all evaluators will accept the rate that school districts are required to pay because it's lower um, than a lot of their private, <coughs> private pay rates. Um, so if, it, you know, we have a list of, of evaluators through MAC that, um, that will accept the rate setting rates if that's, that's of interest and we can provide some options there. Um, I should have mentioned initially that this is one option to request school district funding, but many evaluators also accept private insurance and um, and or mass health um, to fund um, independent evaluations. Okay, so we're going to stop here again for second round of questions. That's great. Thank you all for your questions. Um, I just want to say again, keep them coming through the question box. And if we're not able to get to your question today, you can email communications at massadvocates.org and we can follow up with you uh, after the webinar. So our first question is, in terms of evaluations, when the child is already eligible for special education services and the parent requests an additional evaluation, does the five school days rule apply to seek parent consent or yeah, any time that a uh, parent send a written request, and let me um, stress out the word written, because many times parents just, oh, I called the special education teacher, or I called this person, they said yes, and they haven't sent me anything yet. It's important for parents to uh, send a request in writing, either email or send a letter to school. Again, they can do it in their language. And, uh, and after that, the school has five days um, to respond to the parents. Um, one more question. This is about a case where it was decided to test the student in their native language, but they were later told that they couldn't use the scores because the test was not given in English, which was confusing to the ELL team. Is that true that you can only use scores if the tests are, um, if the test was in English? Well, and this, this is an area of, of some de debate. I mean, it, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of what weight the, the findings can be. I'm not a psychologist or, a, an, you know, expert and a, a specialist in whatever whatever area the testing was done, and, and they would really be best equipped to answer that question for the specific student. Um, but it is something that I've heard before, that it's been, um, that the weight of the, um, the scores or, you know, the findings of that assessment are less, but, but again, it's, it's really not, um, it's not a question of the law so much as, as that, the, that, um, that area that a psychologist, especially a bilingual psychologist would be, um, best equipped to answer. And if, if you're really, if you're interested in knowing, definitely contact us. Um, and I can connect you with someone who, who would be very well equipped to, to respond to that question in that specific case. Um, I'm going to go back to our first section. We had a couple questions about um, the timeliness of providing translation and interpretation. So um, how often does that requirement frustrate the timeliness of meetings and um, are schools allowed to extend the timeline ever to provide translation services for documents and for team meetings? Well, are we talking what the law says or what, what happens in, in reality? Well, there's, there's nothing, exactly. There's yeah. nothing in the law that provides additional time yeah. for school districts mm -hmm. to translate, um, you know, documents that are, whether it's an IEP, an evaluation report, there's, there's nothing in the law that, that requires the additional time. Um, I think part of that question was how often does it frustrate the timeliness of meetings? Um, you know, unfortunately, I think in more cases than not, you know, by the time that team meeting is scheduled, um, you know, within the, the 45 days, um, more often than not, the translation hasn't happened yet. And it's really, um, unfortunately, you know, the parent, 
you know, makes the choice whether they want to go forward with the documents only in English um, or whether they want to request that the meeting be postponed. Well, and I've had for clients that I'm representing, I've had both scenarios. Um, so, but yeah, that legally there's really, there's nothing in the law that allows that additional time. And if it, um, if it has been a problem ongoing or really if it's only been a problem once, um, then, you know, definitely, you know, through our helpline, we can provide guidance on how to file a complaint with the state department of education. Um, and I know that complaints have been filed by colleagues of mine on that issue. Um, but it is, it's a yeah question of the, you know, school districts, you know, kind of working that in to their, their timelines for evaluations when, when the reports need to be translated. Um, one, just a follow up question. Uh, is it correct that the law requires that parents receive only written summaries of evaluation reports and not the full translated report? That is not, not true. Or, yeah, no. That is they not true. Be, yeah. <laughs> they should be receiving the whole evaluation, every single word. Yes, word and in writing. writing. Didn't and you have a writing, case? Yes. Did somebody had a case where they were going to verbally read the yeah. entire IEP in English or, or in, Spanish, in Spanish? Yes. And that that was fulfilling this requirement. And no, I mean, the, the parent is entitled to have the entire report translated in writing. Um, because really it's, it's necessary for that parent to be able to have the opportunity to meaningfully participate in the process. Um, you know, we know even, even as an, a, you know, an attorney that does this for a living, um, you know, I have to read a report multiple times, you know, to, to really, um, you know, fully grasp the, the significance of the report. Every time I read it, I see something new and, and, you know, that's, um, denying parents who, who require the translations, the opportunity, um, to really understand. And this is, this is about their child. So it's, it's, you know, really crucially important. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to keep going. Uh, we talked about the first, um, section, which is the referral. And then now we are moving to the team meeting. So what is the purpose of the team meeting? Well, we um, get together, the team gets together to, can be to discuss evaluations, new evaluations, uh, decide if the child is eligible for special education, um, does the student have a disability, is the student in the right placement, does the student require special education services. Um, we get together in the team also to write the IEP, and um, uh, the team is supposed to meet every year before uh, the end of the, uh, the, the uh, deadline for the IEP. So again, the team meeting happens at least once a year. Parents can request a team meeting at any time. Anytime parents see a change, a change in behavior, a change in performance, um, they, they just had a new evaluation. At any moment, uh, parents can request a team meeting. And uh, we need to emphasize here that parents are key members of the team and their voice, their concerns, their ex expertise on their child, I'll, these, all these are very, very important topics to address at the meeting. Okay, and just that, you know, federal law in terms of for, for English learners, um, federal law is, is very clear um, that limited English proficiency cannot be a determining factor for a student who, to you know, in the determination of eligibility for special education. So um, if a student is an English learner, um, that is, is not a um, determining factor in whether that child um, requires an IEP or special education services. Okay, and who will be at the team meeting? So here, here is a list of um, people who are required um, to be at the team meeting. It's a lot of people, um, and I won't read off this list, um, but really, you know, the point is that there be there are a lot of people. It's very intimidating for parents, um, for any parent um, who, who's, who's, you know, on that side of the table. Um, and it's really a reason 
why, um, you know, especially for parents who, um, who speak a language other than, you know, the rest of the members of the team, um, you know, it, it's very intimidating. And this is where your role as direct service providers, um, if you do attend meetings, can be um, really important. Um, just having someone there that they know um, is with them, that also knows their child, and um, and really, you know, is familiar with the process, and and also not maybe not not as emotionally invested as as a parent is. It's it's very hard um, as a parent to be in this process. I know in my case, I have I have a child who um, was recently found eligible for special education, and the experience of going to a team meeting as a parent. Um, was very different um, from, you know, all of the team meetings that I go to, you know, as um, as an attorney on behalf of another parent. Um, and just important, again, to note, we can't emphasize enough that a qualified interpreter must be provided um, if the parent um, prefers to have one. So, yeah, as uh, Diana was mentioning, the team meeting can be overwhelming for many parents. It certainly was for me, every single time that I went to a team meeting, uh, it was emotionally difficult. Um, you know, we are in a, in a room with 10, 12 uh, people from the school and just mom and dad there. Um, the vocabulary be, uh, beyond the language, uh, uh, and also the vocabulary used might be confusing, even when translator. Um, at the team meeting, uh, we're also uh, mainly talking about the struggles of our children, so it's it's, it's very emotionally um, overwhelming. Um, so as parents, our emotions are high, and the best thing we can do is to come prepare. So how can we do that? And this is uh, one, as Diana was saying, where you can uh, provide that support to the parents. Um, one thing we can do is make sure that we have the evaluations in our language, or the parents' language at least two days before the meeting, so parents can have uh, time to read, review, and understand uh, that uh, the evaluations and the results. Uh, we can invite uh, somebody to come with us to the meeting. It can be a friend to offer emotional support. Doesn't have to be anybody with an expertise in, a, in special education, but it can be somebody who who can be there with a, with mom or dad and just take notes and just uh, go for coffee after the meeting and uh, review notes and provide that emotional support. And you, as um, service providers, uh, you are a key part in this role too. Uh, you work with the family. You know the family. Uh, I'm sure that for these families uh, would be very helpful to have one of you at that meeting. Um, and then, um, well, we need to address the need again and again and again for a qualified interpreter, especially if this has been an issue in the past. Uh, it can't or shouldn't be the front desk person who happens to be bilingual or this other teacher who happens to be bilingual. As Diana mentioned, it has to be a qualified interpreter. Um, and then uh, we also need to point out here that uh, uh, when the uh, student turns 14, they are legally invited to be part of this team meeting. So that's another discussion to have with the parents and U.S. service providers on how to prepare our kids to uh, become part of this team meeting and uh, how do we want the uh, student be involved in the in the meeting. Okay, thank you. And we'll stop again for questions. Okay, um, we only have one question at the moment, so if you have any that came up, please share. This question comes to us from California. Wow. <laughs> um, I helped write a request for an IEP for a client, and the school responded that the child did not qualify for an IEP because it was clear that the difficulty was a language barrier and not a learning disability, in their words. Um, is that correct? Does it matter what state you're in? And if that's not correct, what is the next process to ensure the student is evaluated? They knew the client was a recent immigrant. So, so the important thing is that the if the parent requests that the school district evaluate the student, then they have to evaluate the student. Um, and in some cases, I've seen that school districts, they say, oh, well, okay, we got your request, but is it okay with you if we just try you know, a lot of these other different things first before we evaluate to see if we can address, you know, the concerns that you're having, or maybe why don't we just try, you know, some English language 
um, some you know services for for the student as an English learner. Um, so they're in a sense kind of getting the parent to agree that it's okay to wait to evaluate, um, or they might just be it might just be completely um, not even trying to pretend to be legal about it. But um, but if the parent requests the evaluations, then the school district must conduct them. And it sounds like in those cases, it, it's, you know, the school district should do them in the student's um, native language um, if they're a recent immigrant. Um, so so that's, I think, the, the really important thing to keep in mind there. Um, and just for the parents to continue being push, you know, pushy, be pushy, be, you know, like, no, I, you know, where's the consent form? Like, okay, I'll put your paperwork, or whatever, but please, you know, within five school days, um, you know, expect the consent form in English and in their primary language and, um, and for them to, to act, the school district to act as soon as they receive the, the consent form to, to start the evaluations. So that would apply nationwide? Yes. Okay? Yeah. And uh, well, I should say the timelines I'm a little less uh, sure about, but yes, the, the parent request to, to do an evaluation, um, that, that should apply regardless. Um, but sometimes it's just, you know, requires parents to be pushy and not, um, you know, talked out of it or, or kind of, you know, given the runaround about it um, and just, you know, continue to, to push for that. Um, our next question is, what qualifications should a parent expect of a translator? It's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, according to the federal guidance, um, which is actually a, a summary of the federal guidance related to um, interpreters, is, is attached as a handout to this webinar. Um, but it, what that um, guidance outlines is that um, the interpreter must not only be bilingual, um, but they must be trained in the ethics of interpretation, confidentiality, and the specialized terminology um, that's used in, in the setting. So if it's a special education um, setting, you know, there's plenty of specialized terminology and that interpreter should be prepared to um, with, you know, translate to interpret that terminology. Um, and I mentioned that in Massachusetts, we have this bill that would, um, uh, would require school districts to, um, to provide um, training and assessment of interpreters that are used to, um, in school settings, similar to what exists you know, in court and in medical settings, um, to be clear regarding what the skills and competencies are, um, you know, that uh, that should be required of interpreters in schools to allow for meaningful uh, parent participation. Okay, so now we're gonna we've we've talked about um, the school evaluations. Um, we've talked about the team meeting. Um, maybe we've talked about, um, you know, an independent evaluation um, that has been um, something that the parent has pursued. Um, now we're going to talk about step three, um, which is the parents receive the IEP or the Individualized Education Program um, and the parent's response to the IEP. The IEP is a really important document. And it's really important that parents um, early on, um, you know, become familiar with the IEP um, as, as intimidating as it can be. And this, again, this is where um, service providers can, can be serve a really important role um, in, you know, reviewing a, a proposed IEP with a parent um, to, for them to, you know, become, become familiar and, um, and just to, to help with that understanding. Our helpline also, you know, parents can call us if they have questions also about the IEP and, and through our trainings, we talk we talk a lot about, um, of course, the IEP and, and uh, sections of the IEP. So, you know, absolutely contact us if you have parents who um, you think would be interested in coming together for, for a workshop on that. Um, but 
IEP so important? It's really, it's the contract that outlines the services that the student needs to make progress in school and that the school district is required to provide. So it kind of encapsulates all of the determinations that the special education team has made um, regarding the services that that student requires, um, their goals, and a lot of other information that we will touch upon um, here. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a kind of a summary of the contents of the IEP. Um, we're really not going to have time to talk about each section of the IEP in depth. Um, but I'm going to touch on kind of key areas where parents um, really have the opportunity to participate and that are, that are, you know, it's all important, but, you know, some tools that, um, that, I, that we can highlight um, kind of in understanding the IEP. And the first area um, that I just wanted to highlight was the parent or student concern section of the IEP, um, which is the part of the IEP where the parents document their concerns. And in Massachusetts, the section is for parent input only. Parents can write whatever they want in this section or can, can express to the team um, whatever, they, whatever they want, whatever's concerning them. Concerns can be academic, social or emotional. Um, they can be concerned that their child um, doesn't have friends, that their child isn't leaving their room, that their child, um, you know, is, you know, they have concerns about their child's ability when they're completing their math homework, that it doesn't seem to be, you know, at the same in the, you know, they don't seem to be able to access, um, you know, the, the current academic curriculum in certain areas, you know, whatever those concerns might be. It can be very wide ranging um, concerns they have about the student at home, in the community, um, at school. Um, and really the parent concerns are so important um, it, because it, it's really maybe the only place in the student record where those concerns are documented for that given moment in time. Um, so it's important that they be accurate and um, oftentimes, you know, the parent, even if they come to the meeting prepared um, with a list of their concerns, um, the school district may summarize in a way that really doesn't accurately reflect what the parent expressed. Um, so we, we suggest that parents submit something in writing. Um, if, if that's something that they, you know, that they ought to do, that's kind of the best um, way to go about it and request that the school district incorporate that. Um, if not, then just to, to check that section of the IEP once they have the, the translated version to ensure that it really accurately reflects um, what they expressed, you know, at the team meeting. Um, so, okay, so, and then we'll talk about some of these other areas. Um, yeah, so the IP services, uh, these are just um, uh, examples of some of the services in an IEP, uh, any of this, or occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, parent training, teaching aids, the, um, basically any service that uh, the student needs to learn new skills and information and to make progress services to help the student uh, grow and make progress not only academically but also socially and emotionally so the student can um, is able to function in school at home and in the community and this can be really wide open based on the unique needs of the student um, and the determination of services cannot can really only be based on the needs of the student they cannot be based on the availability of certain um, personnel that are needed, or certain providers, or the cost of services, um, or anything like that. Um, so it, it really should be based on the, the individual and unique needs of, of the student who has a disability. Okay, here we have the service delivery grid, which is, is probably familiar to those of you who have who kind of regularly um, work with parents of children who have disabilities um, and this is a really important part of the IEP that summarizes um, all of the services and consultation that the school district is required um, to provide to the student 
um, and it specifies where the service is required to happen or in what setting. So you'll see here on this slide um, that it's uh, divided into A, B, and C, um, consultation, uh, special education and related services in general education classroom and special education and related services in other settings. Um, so in terms of consultation, that's services that the student may not see. I mean, ideally the, the um, specialist who's providing the consultation um, you know, also sees the student in the classroom, um, but the student, this is just kind of talking about strategies um, in working with a student. Um, to ensure that those strategies are can be are being used, you know, across settings, both during while that child's receiving the direct services and and beyond that, for what we refer to as the B grid, um, these are services that the school district is required to provide in the general education classroom. So with students, um, this is for students who are in a classroom, a general education classroom, with students um, who who do not have IEPs. Um, and some, maybe some other students who do have IEPs. Um, and the C portion of the service delivery grid um, outlines the services that the school district is requ required to provide to the student outside of the general education setting. So all of this, again, um, depends on the individual needs of the student. Sometimes um, a student may need a pullout, what they refer to as a pullout, um, you know, to have fewer distractions, you know, than um, if they were to receive the, the service in the general education classroom. For example, some students receive all of their services in other settings outside of general education. Um, and some students don't receive any services outside of, of the general education classroom. So service delivery, again, um, outlines where the service is required to happen, what the service is or the type of service, who must provide the service, the type of personnel, um, how much of the services the school district's required to provide, and how long the school district must provide the services, which is generally the IEP period, but maybe shorter um, with the start date and end date of the services. Um, so a really useful tool that we often suggest to parents is to compare when they get a new proposed IEP, just to compare what they got, um, the new IEP, the service delivery with the, the prior accepted IEP, just to see if there have been any changes. And if there were any changes that were not discussed at the team meeting, then the parent should definitely bring that to the school's attention in writing in their response, um, because that, that shouldn't be the case. There should be no surprises and no changes that the, the student, the parent wasn't made aware of at the team meeting. I should say that <clears throat> this is kind of filled in, the service delivery, and this is a student who requires pretty um, minimal services, um, actually in the in the realm of, of services, but just wanted to provide an example here for how a service delivery grid might be filled out. And so a note on IE, the IEP and English learners, um, you know, something that we're, we're constantly trying to reinforce is that bilingualism is a strength, not a de deficit, and the IEP should really reflect this. Um, so in, uh, you know, whether it's in the student strengths and key evaluation results section of the IEP, you know, highlighting that this is a bilingual student um, and hopefully identifying ways in the school community or in the larger community, maybe for a transition age student, um, where they can use their, their bilingualism, um, you know, in, in a way that is strength focused, um, you know, is really important. Um, the team must discuss the impact of language needs of the LEP student as related to a free and appropriate public education or as related to special education services. So. Um, the special education team must address the needs of the student as an English learner and as a student who has a disability. Um, can't one can't take priority over the other, um, but they but both must be addressed and both must be both areas of need must be re reflected in the IEP, um, really for the student to receive um, FAPE, the free and appropriate public education, which is which is what to which they're entitled. Um, 
the school district must indicate specific needs and required instruction to address language needs throughout the IEP. And there's no like, formula for doing this, really. I've often seen it in on the pages that are um, present levels of educational performance, where they talk about the accommodations and modifications, you know, that are required for the student. You know, often um, this area is addressed. There happens to be a checkmark box for LEP students, you know, on that page, but really there's no formula. Um, you know, this could be incorporated into the goals um, or really any, any portion of the IEP, depending again on the unique needs of the student. And we'll stop here again for questions. Give it a second. We have a lot to get through today. Um, I'm getting some comments as well, which I will share with Diana after the webinar. Just a reminder that you can email communications at mathadvocates.org if there's anything you want to follow up about after the webinar. Okay. Um, so we're going to go forward. Yeah, so let's uh, um, talk now about, about transition requirements. There are two times in our um, students' life that are uh, uh, transition uh, turning points. One is when they turn three, and the other one is then when they turn 14. Um, so by the time they turn three, um, the district must provide IEP services if the child is eligible. And then um, uh, by the time they turn 14, uh, we start the process of transition to adulthood. Um, and then uh, uh, they need to have a transition assessment, which is then translated into the uh, goals in the IEP. And we need to include here any services in the school or in the community to prepare the, the student for work or for higher education, for independent living, for uh, you know whichever the goals are for or the vision uh, for the student after um, he or she leaves uh, high school. And again, uh, we mentioned this before, the student is invited to the team meeting when they turn 14. And, and uh, we... Um, Need to mention here too that uh, uh, services when uh, for these um, transition um, assessment or the, the transition into adulthood, uh, the services don't have to be only inside the classroom. They can be offering the community such an internship. Uh, the student needs to learn transportation skills or driving lessons. Uh, anything that the student needs so they can be productive members of their homes and community, of course, within the limitations of their disability. Okay, and to talk about IEP placement. Um, so the, the placement refers to um, the setting in which the team decides that the student um, needs. Um, to be able to learn um, and make progress in school. So this, again, is a decision that's made by the IEP team, um, and the team can only consider the unique needs of the child legally. Um, so, you know, in terms of the cost of another program or the availability of, you know, services within a program, um, you know, this, if, if there are certain... Um, resources that are not available, then the school district really, if the team decides, is obligated to pull that together um, to meet the unique needs of the student. Um, the law does refer to uh, prefer um, inclusion of students with, with disabilities, with non-disabled students, as much as possible, regardless of whether that student is um, performing at grade level. Um, so, you know, this is often referred to as the least restrictive environment. If a student um, can make progress, for example, in um, a, a full inclusion program or in general education, um, then the school, the team, um, it would not be appropriate if, you know, to place that student in a, in a substantially separate placement, we'll say. Um, and there are many placement types uh, ranging from, from full inclusion, um, which is the least restrictive environment, it's general education, um, to a residential placement, which is the most restrictive. And this image here on the slide is a, refers to a, um, the placement consent form or a portion of it that lists the different kinds of placements and the definitions um, for each kind of placement, including 
um, the proportion of time to which you know the student is is pulled out um, of the general education classroom. Um, you know, for this is placement is is a big issue. Um, you know, for uh, you know, for English learners, um, especially English learners that re require specialized instruction, um, you know, due to their um, to their their being English learners, and if they require you know primary language instruction, for example, it's a big issue. Um, they need to be placed where they can receive that instruction if the team decides that it is what they need um, to be able to make progress. A note, a, a kind of advocacy point that's really important, if the IEP team is proposing to change a student's placement, it is crucially important that the parent observe the proposed placement before accepting it. This is so important um, for the parent to see really what the placement is going to be like, what the peer group is going to be like, what type of environment it's going to be for their child, um, you know, whether their child whether it's going to be a good fit really for their child is those are questions that really the parent is only going to know if they observe um, the placement that the school district is proposing. So then the IEP is developed and uh, we met and they, we, uh, parents get the IEP and, uh, and then it comes to how to respond to the IEP. So uh, parents have three choices. They can fully accept, fully reject or partially reject. So when they uh, fully accept the IEP, it means they agree with every single section in the IEP, including all the goals, the services, everything in the IEP. And same thing for the full rejection. It means that they don't agree with anything, anything that is um, written in that IEP. Um, what happens most times, I would say, is that uh, parents partially reject the IEP, meaning that they agree with some sections of the IEP, some goals, some, some services, and they reject either um, uh, some services or they reject the fact that they uh, decrease the, um, the amount of services or they uh, reject the omission of certain services like uh, the school is not offering speech and language therapists or they're not offering one-on-one -on -one aid so the parents can uh, partially reject the omission of those services in the IEP. Um, okay. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, don't want to get too much more into yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. It's, and just a point, you know, in terms of the full rejection, a lot of parents, when they don't understand the IEP, mm -hmm. um, they, they're they overwhelmed, they're not sure what to do, it's very official. Well, they're frustrated with the school. Yeah, they and, just uh, don't yeah. know where to go. Um, they will fully reject the IEP. Um, and the impact of that is, is that the school district will continue to implement the prior um, accepted IEP so that it will they'll continue to receive special education services unless it's the child's first IEP um, in which case the student cannot start to receive services until the the IEP is signed um, so just to give a couple of examples of you know when a parent is responding to the IEP and what options they have um, one you know common scenario is if services are, are dropped from the IEP, they're eliminated from the IEP. Um, you know, the parent has, and the parent disagrees. Um, let's say that the school district is saying, oh, your, your child no longer has any issues with communication, um, and so they no longer need speech services, and they no longer need to use a augmentative um, an assistive communication device or a tablet that's used for communication. So we're going to take those out of the IEP. Um, well, the parent disagrees because the parent knows that child at home and in the community and continues to see the difficulties that 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 their child is having, you know, in that area. The parent has the option of partially rejecting the IEP, and this highlights an extremely important right that parents have in the special education process. Um, which is referred to as the right to stay put, um, where if the parent rejects that portion of the IEP, so they partially reject the IEP, they reject the elimination of, of the service 
um, or really any change to the IEP, then the school district must continue providing that service until the parent agrees um, or until a hearing officer decides that the student no longer needs that service to make effective progress. So that's a really important right um, that this comes up all the time on our helpline. Similar with placement, if the school district is proposing a change in placement, um, you know, I have a student who has been, her child has been in a full inclusion placement um, where she, she feels that he, um, needs to be, you know, very strongly based on how she knows her child and, um, you know, at home and in the community um, and, and what she knows about school. The school district wants to uh, place him in a substantially separate classroom. Um, the parent has rejected that placement, the change in placement, um, and so that student has been able to remain in a full inclusion placement. Um, you know, pending, you know, the resolution of the dispute, um, which gets to the importance of the independent expert evaluation, which I should have spelled out on this slide. Um, so I apologize for that. But IEE is, is um, often uh, an abbreviation for independent expert evaluation. Um, and this is where you really need the second opinion, because there's a dispute with the school district. Um, and so the parent, while their child is continuing to receive these services under stay put, the parent should go ahead and make arrangements to have that second opinion um, to, to get that outside opinion. And whoops, just another scenario that comes up um, is where services are not added to the IEP that the parent has requested be added. So maybe that the parent has arranged for an independent expert evaluation and that has been presented to the special education team and it's recommending um, Let's say that that student um, receive, you know, occupational ther direct occupational therapy, um, you know, to address that student sensory needs. Um, school district says no. It's not an issue of, you know, sensory needs. It's it's an issue of, um, you know, he doesn't. He's trying to avoid doing doing his work or whatever, whatever the reasons given, um, the parent can partially reject the, um, the uh, omission of that service to the IEP, um, and they just need to write it either on the lines that are provided on the parent response section or in a separate letter, um, exactly what they are partially rejecting, and again, um, get an independent expert evaluation in that area. In the meantime, in this case where it's a new service that hasn't been in the IEP, the school district is not required to add it to the IEP um, if the parent has partially rejected, um, which is why the, the parent, all the more reason the parent needs to be um, kind of gathering um, opinions, the second opinion, um, to be able to present that to the team. And we we'll, want to finish up and then do questions at oh. the end. Oh, yeah. So maybe we'll just do our oops, um, takeaway. We'll do that. We'll do takeaway points and then yeah. we'll go back and we'll, we'll do questions at the end. Um, so these are just some key points. We know that there's been a lot of information mm -hmm. um, that we presented and there are just a few key takeaways that we want to be sure that you that you have. Yeah, the number one that I think we've stressed out many, many times throughout the webinar is that uh, uh, all the rights discussed up, uh, here in the webinar apply regardless of the parent or student national origin or immigration status. Children receive better services when parents are involved. An interpretation translation is required by law and essential for many parents to participate. Evaluations must be conducted in the student's native language if necessary. And the IEP must address the language needs of LEP students with disabilities. And school districts cannot eliminate services from the IEP without parent consent or a decision from a hearing officer to do so, also referred to as stay put. Um, also important, an important takeaway um, to absolutely contact Max Helpline, which is provided here or you can go online and submit an online form request for helpline assistance at www.massadvocates.org backslash helpline. 
the number to our helpline is 617-357-8431 and you can indicate if you prefer English or Spanish. If you're working with a family who speaks a language, another language, um, then um, they can they can leave. Uh, probably the best thing to do is um, if you can assist them in just leaving a message and we can contact them with a with a phone interpreter um, or with um, to to be to communicate with them to gather more information and to get involved with Mac advocacy you can email communications at massadvocates.org. I did just want to say um, quickly because it was it was on the outline that if the parent um, has gone through the entire process, um, they've they've got done the evaluations, the independent evaluations, they've met with the team about the independent evaluations and, and their um, disagreements uh, regarding the IEP. The parent does have the option to request a mediation through the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, um, request a hearing, re you know, request a hearing through the Bureau of Special Education Appeals, which is an option that often requires um, the assistance of an attorney. Um, the Massachusetts um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Problem Resolution System, or PRS. The website is provided here. That's where, for example, there's been, um, the school district has not complied with the law to provide interpretation and translation, or maybe they're not following the timelines. They're not responding to a request for an evaluation in a timely way. Whatever the case might be, the parent does have the option of filing a complaint with the um, with uh, the PRS, um, and there is the U.S. Office of Civil Rights of the United States Department of Education. Also, if the the parent feels that they're that they have been discriminated against um, for reason of their national origin or their race um, or their um, disability um, or any other protected status, then that is an option. Or they feel that their student has. So I think we'll go to questions, final opportunity to ask questions, and there are resources at the very end also um, for additional information. Do I have these slides a little? Yes. Um, so we had a couple questions related to transition. One of the questions is, do you have recommendations uh, for schools regarding transition planning for undocumented students aging out who are not eligible for adult services, uh, like group home living, respite, supported work services, adult day programs um, through adult agencies once they turn 22. Yeah, I mean, we could we could do referrals. Our focus is really on, you know, special access to special education services, but I think that um, you know, it's something that the team definitely needs to be considering. And there, I know that even, you know, even individuals who are undocumented um, do have access to some, you know, state services. Um, and so we, we could make, a, you know, a referral to um, somebody who kind of focuses either through the Department of De Developmental Services or DDS or somebody at maybe one of the um, autism support centers um, who could who could help kind of guide the family in in that area towards what may be available okay next question how challenging is it for parents to obtain funding for IEEs are they entitled if they disagree or do they need to prove that the evaluations the school did were inadequate and how would a parent do that so Except so there I, if you'll remember there are the two options that are that are on the screen for students that are requesting the evaluation uh, the independent expert evaluation under um, under Massachusetts law um, who are low income who are using or who or are using the sliding fee scale mm. um, it's it's really not if they get a response from the school district, usually the challenge can be getting a response from the yeah. school district. That's one. Um, generally, it's not a denial of the um, evaluation unless it's been outside of the 16 month time frame uh, from when the school district did their um, their evaluations. The challenge can be really finding an evaluator who will um, Evaluate the child, you know, using state rating, state what they call rate setting rates. Um, and so, generally, if if the the parent is requesting the evaluation using that basis, um, 
in my experience, it hasn't been an issue. Like I said, you know, a Max Helpline, um, you know, if, if you do contact the helpline or want to um, suggest that a parent contact the helpline for uh, template letters for requesting the evaluation or um, a list of evaluators who accept the rate setting rates, we can, we can offer that. Um, and, or if the school district is, you know, kind of ridiculously just saying no, like there doesn't seem to be a basis for why they're denying it, we can also talk them through that um, about next steps. And also, uh, it's uh, it's a key to find an evaluator that is an expert on the uh, area that we're trying to evaluate, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, you know, uh, depending on the disability, and they, they they work with the age range of the student, yeah. and they and they can really evaluate. Some evaluators are more uh, evaluating to trauma or autism or different things, so it's important to make that distinction too. Yeah, to make all those consider, and we can talk through with parents. Um, you know, contact our helpline or if if you call the helpline, you know, on their behalf. Okay. Um, and would the family request special education evaluations at the school level or at the district level? It shouldn't really matter. I, I think it varies from school district to school district. Yeah. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter. We, we often suggest that parents um, CC the, include the special education director in a request um, if they if they know who that is in their request for an evaluation but um, the school district is on you know is really obligated to respond to the request whether it's submitted to the principal um, you know or somebody at the at the local um, you know school um, or at the district level um, so it's just you know if they haven't received the consent form within five days of submitting the written request for the evaluation, definitely follow up because things do fall through the cracks. Um, so depending on the school district, it might be that they're not used to accepting these at the school, you know, at the local school or the classroom teacher got it and doesn't know what to do, with, you know. So just follow up if, if there hasn't been, if they haven't received the consent form, you know, within the five school days of, um, of providing the request for the evaluation. Um, we just got a comment. There's a directory of bilingual school psychologists that do testing and evaluations on the National National Association of School Psychologists website. That's naspconline.org. Thank you so much. Naspconline.org. And if you just search bilingual directory on their website, you'll find it. Sounds like a great resource. We're always, always in, in demand. It's That's another challenge, you know, in, in terms of requesting IEEs. It's a very few. We work primarily with Spanish-speaking um, families at, at MAC just because of we have Proyecto Acceso. Uh, but even even with the most commonly you know, spoken um, language. is a big need, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very, it can be very challenging. Yeah. Um, to find a, an independent evaluator who can evaluate in yeah. um, in the student's uh, native language. So thank you. Now we just have a couple of quick questions related to um, ESL classes. Do ESL classes need to be included in the IEP and are ELL teachers required to attend IEP meetings? So yeah, I yes. I mean, there should be an ELL um, somebody who represents the ELL um, side of the student, at the, if that student is an English learner at team meetings. A lot of times, um, I know in Boston frequently, uh, teachers are, are, you know, have all these certifications. They're dually cert, they're a mm -hmm. classroom, you know, they're a general ed teacher, they're a special educator, you know, and they have their ELL um, certification or endorsement. So, um, you know, it may be the one person, you know, who's representing that need of the student, but um, yes, they, they should be at the team meeting. And um, I think the other part of the question was about, um, there was another part of that question, I'm sorry. Um, ESL in the IEP. Oh, in the IEP. Mm -hmm. um, yes, if that student is an English learner, it, it must be addressed in the IEP. There's actually a, a page in the IEP, um, present levels of 
educational okay. performance mm -hmm. B, um, where there's a set of check mark boxes at the top, and one of them is LEP student. Um, that mm -hmm. that shouldn't be enough. The check mark box <laughs> doesn't say. I'm not saying that the check mark box should be enough, but um, you know that's one place where absolutely it should be indicated, and then there should be depending on the needs of the student, it should be, um, you know, throughout the IEP, infused throughout the IEP, the needs um, of that student as an English learner. Okay, thank you so much for participating. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, we weren't able to get to everyone's questions today. If you have an urgent question that we weren't able to address, you can contact our helpline. That's the number on your screen. Um, 617-357-8431 can direct you there. Um, and then if you want to follow up on anything, you can also contact communications at massadvocates.org. And again, please keep an eye on your email inbox. We're going to be sending out the handouts and a recording of today's webinar to all our registrants. And please fill out our short survey you'll be getting as soon as you close out. It's only three questions. You'll be getting an email about that as well. Thank you.